Last week uh, was an interesting week. The last week began for me by reading two articles by two people that basically said that they have made a decision to leave the faith. One article was by the ex-pastor of a mega church. The ex-pastor of a mega church in America. And the other article was by an ex-worship leader of a mega church who's after 20 years of leading worship and writing songs and all of that, made a choice to say that I'm not so sure I believe in all these things anymore. When I read that, and the, the, the questions he said were so simple. You know, anybody who's, who's taught the fundamentals of the Christian faith know those answers of uh, how can a good God send people to hell? Simple, simple questions. But yet after 20 years of worship leading, did not know the fundamentals of God's word. But when I read that, what came to my mind was Matthew's gospel 24, verse 10 and verse 12. The Bible says in Matthew 24, verse 10 and verse 12, it says like this, in the last days, the many will leave the faith. And the Bible also goes on to say that in the last days, the love of most will grow cold. The love of most growing cold is not because God is not a loving God. Neither is it because there isn't an available truth in God's word that explains and clarifies the faith. The love of most growing cold is because for, for us to ongoingly love Jesus, it takes more than just knowing something from the scripture here and there. It is important for us to be founded clearly and strongly upon God's word. And in fact, the Bible also goes on to say that the Bible says that he who stands endures till the end shall be saved. Amen. Who will be saved? The Bible says he who endures till the end. This morning, I want to take a message called the works of faith. Over the next three weeks, I'll be doing this. The works of faith. And I think it's a very, very, very important message for many of us to understand. When people, when I, when I listen to people getting confused. I personally do not blame them as much as I see that part of the reason the church is losing its faith, people, some people in the church, I cannot say the church is losing faith, most around the world still hold on to their faith. Some people in the world, in some parts of the world are losing their faith because the leaders or the pastors or those that are supposed to equip the body of Christ are not speaking the truth anymore. They are speaking what sells, what's a good brand in the market. It's good lights and sounds and, 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 and getting people in and, and telling them something what the Bible calls another gospel. Say that after me, another gospel. The Bible says another gospel, another Jesus, another spirit. So in the midst of diluting the word of God, they have diluted it so much and some of them got a lot of the air time. They have diluted the word of God so much that what they eventually preach is not the gospel of the kingdom. What they eventually preach is another gospel, another Jesus. So when, we, when, we, when many preachers over the years have uh, taught certain things, there came a confusion because one group of churches over a period of time took it so much into legalism that it was, they made it like only because of certain works you're going to go to heaven. And some of the Christians over the years got a revelation about grace. And they said, it is not by your works. It is not by your works. It has nothing to do with your works, which is true. Which is true. They say it is by grace and grace alone, not by works and none of us you should boast, which is absolutely true. But at which point do we let go of theology to build brand is the question. And what happens is, let me take you through this whole concept of the works of faith. The Bible says God wants us to have the works of faith. Everybody say, my faith needs to have works. Now, I'll tell you why I'm talking about this, because I'm going to define some of these words clearly to you, so you will understand in which portions of the Bible God refers to which aspect of the faith. I remember one day, a very famous man of God, from the eastern part of the world, a very, very famous man of God who teaches a lot about grace. He's very commonly or popularly known to many people. Uh, I read an article that, that talked about 
why certain things about his doctrine is erroneous. And I remember reading that article and when I compared to scripture, I just knew what that article said was 100% true. But the thing is, this man is so popular that we equate popularity to theological soundness. We think if he's so popular, then he must be right. So I remember I posting that article on Facebook. I just forwarded, I posted it on Facebook. It was an article written by another reputed magazine. And the moment I posted it, the next day, I got one of my friends from across the globe writing back to me and said, John, how do you speak against this man of God? You, you know, then the person said, his books changed my life. Now, I read that, of course, I didn't reply to that. What came to my mind was this. Because somebody's book changed our life, does that mean their theology is sound? Do you understand what I'm saying? Amen? Because somebody's book, someone said something about grace or faith or things like that, does that mean everything they're saying is sound? Now look at this. In the Bible says, I want to take this into what are these works of faith? Are there works of faith? First Thessalonians 1 verse 2 and 3 says like this, We give thanks to God always for you all, making mention of you in our prayers. All right, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith. And this is what I'm going to look at. Everybody say work of faith. He says, constantly bearing in mind your work of faith and labor of love and steadfastness of our hope in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul is just giving thanks to God to the, for the Thessalonians church. He's saying, that church is laboring for God. There are some churches that want God to labor for them. And there are some other churches that are seriously laboring for God. And he goes on to say, I want to thank God for you because you've been laboring for God. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 verse 11 and 12 says like this, To this end we also pray for you always. Paul is writing to, to the Thessalonian, the second letter. To this end we also pray for you always that our God will count you worthy of your calling. Now, you know, when the scriptures begin to put words in place that confuse popular theology, that our God should find you worthy of your calling, which means God has called you. And now what we think, but we are already counted worthy, aren't we? The day we believed in Jesus, the day we said the sinner's prayer, aren't we counted worthy? Now does God have to count us worthy again? And now we see the scripture telling us that to this end we are praying for you. It's not that we prayed for you that God would count you worthy and the day you got saved you are now counted worthy and there is nothing more to count anymore. Paul is writing to them, we are ongoingly praying for you. We are praying that you believers, the elect, the chosen, the born again, the spirit filled, the, the tongue talking, the demon bashing, Bible reading believers will be counted worthy for the kingdom. Wow. Now that puts us in a very precarious place. He says that our God will count you worthy of your calling and fulfill every desire for goodness and the work of faith and the labor of of love, or the work of faith with power so that the name of Jesus will be glorified in you and you in him according to our Lord Jesus Christ. So here rises the million dollar question. The question is, are we saved by faith or are we saved by works? All right, let's look at this question. And my simple answer is, we are saved by faith and we will look at that and I know you will agree because so much of what is preached all over the years is this, but I'm going to take you through some other scriptures too. Let's go to Romans chapter 3, it's a, verse 21, we're going to look all the way to 31 quickly. I'm going to read some portions of scripture here, Romans 3 verse 21. Now apart from the law, throw that scripture out for me please, Romans chapter 3 verse 21. Now apart from the law, the righteousness of God has been manifested being witnessed by the law and the prophets. Even the righteousness of God through what? We are at 22, the last part now. Even the righteousness of God, come on, through faith, which means I've been made righteous by, how did I become righteous? By faith. Is there an agreement on this now? All right, so the righteousness of God through faith in Jesus for all who believe and there is no distinction. Between whom? For verse 23, it's a very popular verse, read it together. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Verse 24, being justified as a gift of His grace. How did we get justified? How did we get justified? By His grace, but how did that grace come? 
by faith. But what does it say? It was given as a gift. Everybody say gift. How do you receive a gift? You just receive that gift, right? Do you have to qualify for it? Do you got to cry for it? Do you have to beg for it? Do you got to fight for it? Do you got to work hard? Do you have to strain for it? No, you just receive. Thank you. So the Bible says, even though all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, we are now justified by a gift of His grace. Through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in His blood through faith. This was to demonstrate His righteousness because in the forbearance of God, He passed over sins previously committed. Now listen, He passed over sins. Come on, help me. He passed over sins. Now, there is a theology that says He has forgiven our past, present and future sins. Now, I don't want to get into all the details, but let me just stick with this scripture, forgiven our sins that we have previously committed. The problem is many people are not faithful to scripture. We are faithful to what we want to hear. That's what 2 Timothy 3, the, uh, the beginning part says. In the last days, people will be there whose ears are itching to hear what they want to hear. Forgive our sins previously committed. And then he goes on to say, for the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, so that he would be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in God. Some people say, once you have eternal life, can you lose eternal life? Because eternal life is eternal. Correct? All kinds of arguments they have. How can you lose eternal life because eternal life is eternal? But then the definition of eternal life, you ask them, they will say that is living forever because they have not read John 17, 3. And this is eternal life that you may know Jesus Christ. Eternal life is eternal. Now, I want to ask you something. When somebody does not know Jesus, they go to, to eternal damnation. Correct? Are they alive in eternal damnation or are they dead? Come on, help me. Are they alive in hell or are they dead in hell? And is that life eternal or it will finish after some time? Which means if you go to heaven or you go to hell, you have eternal life. You're, by which you're living eternally. So that cannot be the definition of eternal life. Because for God so loved the world that he gave Jesus, that who shall believe in him should not perish but have everlasting or eternal life. So eternal life cannot be unending life. Then what is eternal life? John 17, 3 says, this is eternal life that you know Jesus Christ as your Lord. So the day you ask Jesus to come into your life, you just began your eternal life. Amen. Which means, if, what is eternal life? The eternity in the presence of God is eternal life. Anything outside the presence of God May be eternal, may be living, but won't be life. Ah, oh, I like that. Come on. Amen. It may be eternal, it may be living, but it won't be. Jesus said, I have not come to give you, you know, just a, a living, something to be living about. I've come to give you life and life abundant. Now, when Jesus said, I have come to give you life, did the people, hearers, have life already? Which means they were alive, right? So to alive people, he's saying, I've come to give you life. So that's, that means the life he was offering was not the life they had, was not the physical life they had. The life he was offering, according was John 17, 3, was knowing Jesus Christ, was being restored back to peace with God. Eternal life is to live a life in peace with God for eternity. That is eternal life. So... Verse 28 says, like, verse 27 says, we, we were looking at in Romans and chapter 3, 27 says, when then is the boasting, it's excluded by the kind of, by what kind of law of works? No, but of the law of faith. So he's saying it's not by works anymore we are saved, for we maintain that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is it God, the God of the Jews only? Is he not the God of the Gentiles also? Yes, Gentiles, indeed. For verse 31 says, do we then nullify the law through faith? May it never be. On the contrary, we establish the law. Amen. Then it also says in Galatians chapter 2, verse 15 and 16. We're going to look at some scriptures. I'm building something up here. Galatians 2, 15, 16. We are Jews by nature, not sinners from among the Gentiles. 
Now I tell people, a lot of people, when they hear the word Gentiles, they think, if, especially if you come from a generational Christian uh, family background, back in your homes you may have heard, we are not like the Gentiles. And we think suddenly we have this feeling, we are like the Jews. We are not like the Jews, you are a Gentile. Except that you don't live like the Gentiles. What the Bible refers to Gentiles, people who don't know God. Anyone who does not know, you, you, you know, you might say, I'm from this original family from some part of Kerala. There's nothing original about your family. Everyone came from Adam and Eve. If everyone on the planet came from Adam and Eve, everybody's original. Oh, come on now, don't go quiet on me now. Amen. If you think you are of another family greater than the ones that came from others, which means you didn't come from Adam and Eve. If you didn't come from Adam and Eve, the only thing left is the theory they teach you in school, that you came from monkeys. Now, that's not original anymore. That's evolving. So, the point I'm trying to say is this. We are not better than the Gentiles. We are Gentiles that are saved by the mercy of God. We are God's mercy. So we are not any better than somebody turning to Christ from any other background today. We are all were in the kingdom of darkness. Now we have come to his marvelous light. So I want to first establish that we are saved by grace, by nothing else, correct? But now having been justified, there will have to be, the Bible says, some works that God wants us to do. That will manifest this justification. Now listen to this one, what I'm saying carefully. You're not justified by faith. But once you are justified by faith, you're not, not only justified by faith. Once you are justified by faith and not by works, there are some works that begin to manifest that represent the fact that you are justified. Amen. Until I got married... I did not know whom to get married. I was sharing in the other service. I was saying, when I was a little kid, somebody told me, they, you'll find your wife's name's first letter written on your thumb. So a little boy, nine, ten years old, somebody told me that I would look which letter. Except I didn't know which language it will be written in. You know, I mean, naturally it would have to be in English because all I knew was English. So I looked at which possible letters were there and all of that. And so until the day I got married. The day I got married, there was a covenant I made with my wife. That day, what happened? The way I started living began to change. Why? Because the covenant changed. Until then, I had permission to look out. But from the day I made a covenant with God and my wife, the way I lived changed. When I would come home, maybe, or before getting married, maybe I thought about myself all the time. But now I got married, I stopped thinking only about myself. When I would step out of the house, I'd probably think of my wife too. Before I thought about whether I got food. Whether mommy got or others got didn't matter to me. You know, so like some of us hungry young boys, they come to the table, you don't know, it's like a storm hit the table. Everything just disappeared, you know. And, and, and you don't care about who else has got there, you know, there to eat. But now that you're married, you begin to think, hey, wait a minute, is there food for everybody? Does everyone have? You have children now. Now you begin to tell yourself, no, I shouldn't eat. Let the children eat first. And then we'll see after that. Why? It's because the way we begin to live changed because the covenant changed. In the same way, until we knew, did not, as long as we didn't know Jesus, how we lived was like the Gentiles. We lived for ourselves, we lived in sin, we lived in all kinds of wickedness. But the day we accepted Jesus, that day onwards, the way we lived began to change. The covenant changed. They began to have works of our faith. Amen. Hallelujah. Throw up for me if you can, Ephesians in chapter 2. And I want you to look at verse 10. This is a powerful verse that, you know, from 10 onwards. Look what it says in Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10 onwards. The Bible is talking about how our lives have been transformed by this faith. Ephesians 2, in fact, talks about it's by grace you've been saved through faith, not by works, and none of you should boast. Now look at this. For Read this together for me. What does it say? For we are His workmanship. Which is, who are His workmanship? Born again or not born again people? Born again people, right. We are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for what? For what? No, I thought you, he created you to take you to heaven for takeoff. Maranatha, come soon, Jesus. Now, he didn't create you for takeoff. He created you for work here on earth. Amen. Come on, so read it. For we are his, which means you and I, our intricate design is, is an ability to work for God. Oh, come on now. Amen. 
you have an intricate design of making of heaven to work for God, to serve Him. That is your design. Some people say, well, I'm not a pastor, I'm not a shepherd. Nobody asked you to be a pastor. You don't have to be a pastor to serve God. But yet you need to have a heart that has repented from sin. We are intricately designed, created in Christ Jesus. For what? For good works, which God has prepared beforehand so that we can walk in it, which means God has prepared an assignment for you and me to walk in. God has prepared a work. He's created us for that work. Now listen, some people say, I'm creating, you know, I'm doing the will of God. God's called me to be an engineer in a corporation. No, God's not called you to be an engineer in a corporation. He's given you a tool to be an engineer. He's called you to do his good works. Amen. Along with it, if you're an engineer, well, use that for designs. If you're a doctor, use that. If you're a professor, use that. If you're a teacher, use that. But you're not called for that profession. You're called for God's good works. Amen. That's what you're created for. And what is that profession? It's a tool to fulfill the call. Amen. Don't make the tool your call. Amen. The the tool is a tool to fulfill the call. Christians are taught from the right to left often, the opposite way around. People, if, if there is one kind of pro- theology that is damaging, people will come with the opposite kind of theology and that becomes popular. Then 50 years down the road, when that becomes so skewed, they will come with another kind of theology and that becomes popular. In order to confront the legalistic way from where we have to do something or the other to earn our salvation from God, which many churches began to preach, This became the basis of so many false religions. And so the emphasis now has become that we have to do nothing to be saved, just receive it by faith, which is true. Because Ephesians 2 verse 8 and 9 says that. But where wheat is being sown, tares surely will come while the sowers are sleeping. Matthew's Gospel 13, 25 says this. Now, a man called Jacob uh, Nainan from, uh, from Bangalore, he's a theologian, he writes like this. Forgiveness of sin is made so free by the preachers that there is no need for repentance from sin or even an acknowledgement that we are sinners headed for destruction. So thousands are given the false impression that they already are the children of God when all that has happened is that they have said a prayer asking Jesus to come into their heart to be their personal savior. But the question is, What would this mean to people who say they want Jesus as their savior and yet have not heard a message from the preacher as to what they need to be saved from? Many say Jesus is my savior, but they don't know what they say he saved them from. That God is saving you from a life of sin. The message of the gospel is so clear. Repent. And do the works of God. Repent. Turn around from darkness. Repent. Leave the the kingdom of darkness. Come into the kingdom of light. Now that's not just a citizenship transfer. That is a lifestyle transfer. It is a walking away from sin. And walking into the life of God. Oh, but that's not a very popular message. You know, I'm not really a very popular preacher. But I want you to know popular preaching is not what always saves us from destruction. As someone who is struggling with a sickness, it's not popular to, for the doctor to tell that person you need a surgery. That poor doctor doesn't become the most popular doctor. You know what we'll do? We'll go for a second, third, fourth opinion. Why? Because we want to be sure that we, why should we go under that knife? If, and yet that might be what will save us from that sickness. So forgiveness of sin is made so free by preachers, there's no need. What would this mean to people? So many do not have any idea that what they need to be saved from. Then they are taught that every blessing is theirs in Christ. (laughs) When they are not even in Christ. Are you listening to what I'm saying? How do I get every blessing in Christ when I'm not even in Christ? Every failure to see a result 
in this formula praying and formula preaching is blamed back on the lack of their faith or an unconfessed sin or an ancestral sin. Jesus said that we would know the truth and the truth will set us free. What if we don't even know the truth about our sins? Why would, and why Jesus had come to the earth in the first place? What if we aren't even looking for salvation from sin? But we're only looking for a possibility of going to heaven. There are so many people just looking for a possibility of going to heaven. If I can accept Jesus, I want to go to heaven. I can accept Jesus, oh, I don't have to go to hell. I can go to heaven. But accepting Jesus is not a, a pathway to go to heaven. Accepting Jesus is saying, I am so convicted that I'm a sinner. That, that's the gospel. I am so convicted that I have sinned for all man has. And what? Fallen short of what? The glory of God. That's the gospel. That's what Peter preached. That's what the disciples preached. What shall I do to be saved? They asked in Acts 2, repent and be baptized every one of you. That was a gospel of repentance, turning around. They knew what they needed to do to be saved. What does it mean to be saved? Not going to heaven. To be saved means to be made whole again. The word saved comes from the Greek word sozo. Sozo does not mean going to heaven, take off. Sozo means to be restored back to wholeness. That is sozo. Restored back spiritually. Restored back emotionally. Restored back. It is to be brought back to. It is to come back to shalom with God. It is coming back to a peace with God. And after we have lived a life here on earth in peace with God, the natural result of living a life of peace with God is that we have eternity with Him. Amen. Amen. That we have Christ as our Savior. That we have Christ as our Lord. That we have Christ with us. Now Jesus said very sadly that majority of people will be walking away on the broad way that leads to destruction. While there will only be a few who will choose to walk on the way to life. The enemy has deceived so many people. What do we do? The promise to Israel was a promised land. But the promise to a child of God is not heaven. Listen to me. Even though heaven is going to be a natural result of the promise. The promise to a child of God was to be restored back to peace with God. And to be transformed into the image of his son Jesus. When we are at peace with God and we are transformed to image of Jesus, we begin to live like Jesus, walk like Jesus, talk like Jesus, do what Jesus did, and the natural consequence of that is eternity. This is why the Bible says that it does not say, do the formula prayer and you are saved. It says, work out your salvation with fear and trembling, which means the day you and I accept Jesus as our king, our salvation has begun by grace, through faith. And then he says, now keep at it, be at it, so that you will not fall away. The Bible says many in the last days will what? Fall away. Falling away is a reality of our times. Because the gospel is not popular anymore. The truth is not popular. Why would I want somebody to judge me? You know, the fact about eternal judgment is not a popular message anymore. Why? I mean, it's very uncomfortable to think that after I die, somebody is going to call me to account. A very uncomfortable thing, but that is the truth. That is why Apostle Paul stood there. Even he looked at Governor Felix and he told Governor Felix, he said, Felix, three things I want to tell you. I know you're sitting on the throne and I'm here in chains, but I got three things to tell you. Number one, get right with God. Number two, live a life of self-control. Number three, there is a coming judgment. When he was preaching to a governor, he's telling the governor there's a coming judgment. Why? Because he was so convinced he was not preaching another gospel. He was not telling Felix, come to Jesus. You have only one throne. God will give you ten thrones. Come to Jesus. You have one robe. He will give you ten. He will expand your kingdom from the east to the west. He said, repent, Felix. Felix, repent and get right with God. This is the beginning point of the gospel. Coming back, a sinner coming to the foot of the cross and saying, Father, I have sinned. 
I am coming back to you. I, I am convicted of my sin. I want to come back to you. I, this is the beginning of the gospel. Any gospel without repentance, any gospel without conviction of sin is another gospel. And that's where God is beginning this journey. And sadly, Jesus said, many are choosing the broad way. If there is any genuine turning away, turning to God, there will be a change of heart followed by a transformed life. Now, having said that we are saved by grace, through faith, not by works. Did we agree on that? Now, let's look at James chapter 2, and we're going to look at verse 14 onwards. James chapter 2 and verse 14 onwards. It says over here in James 2 verse 14, what use is it, is it my brethren? Let's read it together. What use is it, my brethren? Brethren is who, born again or not born again? Come on, help me. So is he writing to some Gnostic or is he writing to some Jew or is he writing to some... Who is he writing to? He's writing to the church. My brethren, if someone says he has faith, he has faith but he has no works, can that faith... Now here is a question that James wants to answer. He's saying, I know, I know Paul has written about saving grace. I understand that. But if someone says he has faith but no works, can that save your faith? Save him. Look at the next verse. It says, if a brother, read it. If a brother or sister is without clothing and is in need of daily food, and one of you says to them, go in peace, be warm, and be filled, and yet you do not give him what is necessary for their body, what use is that? Verse 17. Read it. Even so, Okay, okay. Now, so even so, faith without works is dead. Now, the Bible says, James is saying, faith without works of faith. Now, here's where the confusion begins. So when the preachers say, it is not by works, it is not by works, they mix up all these different works. You saw works here, you saw works there, you saw works there. Then they'll check the Greek of that, they'll check the Greek of this. But the problem is they don't read the whole book together. If you were to, your son were to write a letter to you, your son went to college, shot you an email or sent you a long letter, how would you read that letter? You would read the, the second last two lines together first, all right? And then you'll read two lines, the middle paragraph, last two lines of the middle paragraph, right? Then you meditate on it for two weeks. And then for the next two months, you don't read your letter, son's letter. You've forgotten what it said. Because every day there's no time to read the letter. And then you come back and then you'll say, okay, today I will start from the beginning. And you go to the beginning, you read two lines and suddenly it was time to go to work, so you left it there. Many people don't understand that the Bible is a letter. The Bible is supposed to read from book to book, from, from beginning. There were no chapters and verses. It was a letter written to the churches. If it was a letter written to the churches, you know what you should do? You should read the whole book. You should read the, do you read letters at one go? Huh? The only letter you won't read at one go is the termination letter. <laughs> Usually that's not very long. It's just, <laughs> someone said like this, you know, in, in certain companies, if they want to terminate you, they, they, write, they give the pink slip. Monday morning you come, you get a pink slip. They say, it was, you know, it's really hard to let you go because you've been such an amazing worker and all of that, you know, uh, but from this coming Monday morning, we'll try. You know, so many, many times when you read the books of the Bible, we don't get the whole concept because we read little by little. Even so, faith without works is dead. So the Bible says, the first thing I want to say is there is something called a dead faith. Because I have faith, it, an unactivated, unacted upon faith is what kind of faith? Is dead faith. A body that does not have movement and does not have breath, what do you call it? Dead body. A faith that does not have action and does not have life. What do you call it? Which means dead faith is like a dead body. How do I know that? Verse 26. It says in verse 26, As the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without. Which means when a Christian says, I believe, but does not have a change in life that he wants. I believe Jesus will take me to heaven, but I still want to lie. I still want to live in sin. 
I still want to commit immorality or hate or be a hypocrite. I don't want to change my life, but I believe Jesus will take me to heaven. The Bible says that is like a dead body. Mm. You know what happens to dead bodies when you leave it for a while? It begins to smell. And that's what happens to our faith. It's a faith. But yet we tell ourselves, no, 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 that popular preacher said, buy my book and CDs now. A pack of seven for only two dollars and, and subscribe to my... Why? Because he said so and he's popular and he's on TV. Therefore, it must be the truth. The Bible says faith without actions is dead. Not only is it dead faith. Now, here's where it gets interesting. Verse 18. Look at verse 18. Come on, read it, read it. Come on, guys. Help me. Verse 18. But someone may well say, you have faith and I have works. Show me your faith without works and I will show you my faith and my works. Next verse. You believe that God is one, you do well. And demons believe too and they shudder. Now, this is the interesting thing. What is the Bible saying? It's saying you say that you have faith without works. I have faith with works. You believe that God is one. Even demons believe that. You know what the Bible is saying? A, f- a life of faith without works of that faith is the faith that demons have. Oh, oh no, come on. You guys are... You guys are not happy today. No, is there in your Bible? Faith without works. You believe God is one, even demons believe that. So he's saying it's no big thing to agree to a concept. It is basic demon, minimum qualification to be a demon is they must believe that Jesus is Lord. (laughs) That's That's why it's so easy for so many Christians to be To be saved and live like the devil. It says the demons believe. So what's the difference between a demon and a child of God? The difference is that they believe and they stop there. We believe and we act upon it. That's the difference. It's the works of faith that make a child of God stand apart. From the, that's why the Bible says in 1 John, it says the children of the Antichrist are obvious. And the children of God are obvious. How? Those who practice unrighteousness are unrighteous. And those who practice righteousness, they are righteous. They are the children of God. Oh, suddenly now the children of God is not our confession. The children of God is our action that goes with our confession. We know who the children of God really are, are by the choices that we are now making. Therefore, the Bible says, flee youthful lust, run away. But pastor, what if I sin? If we sin, the Bible says, we have an advocate with the Father. Jesus Christ the righteous. So is the Bible saying if you make one small mistake, you're going to hell? No. The Bible is saying it is obvious where you and I are choosing to go. God's not setting anyone anywhere. He's saying, what is your choice? Many people say, God is so, if he's so loving, how can he send anybody to hell? God is not sending anyone to hell. Are you listening to me? God is not sending anybody to hell. Hell was not prepared for man. Hell was prepared for the devil, the enemy. But will people go to hell? Yes. Why will they go to hell? They will go to hell because, not because God is sending, because God would not know Where else to send people who want to follow the enemy and don't want to repent and turn to Christ? Because the remaining domain is God's. So you can't be in God's domain, live in rebellion, get to heaven, live like the devil, be a double agent. Amen. Like in the movies. You're in here, but you're never sure. Halfway during the movie, movie, you're there, but you're really never sure. The movie ain't over yet. (laughs) And then you're back there again. And, and you know, all kinds of things. And then the two double agents, they switch. <laughs> Both double agents meet each other. And this is the place. And oftentimes, the place that double agents meet in Christianity is in the church. Are you listening to me? Pastor, what are you preaching? Have you read Jude? Have you read portion of 2 Peter 2? It says people have come into the church In Malayalam, I like it. And the Bible says, and they are teaching you. They are what? They are what? 
If they're teaching you, where are they? They're on the pulpit. Do you understand what I'm saying? Which means they preach, they have got themselves through deception all the way to the pulpit. The only problem is they begin in the name of Jesus and they close the message in the name of Jesus. And because they do that, we think they're not. The Bible says they are among you. They have brought in deceptive theology. And the Bible says they're taking with them people to their own destruction. Which means they're going to destruction and they're taking the church with them. So this is why the Bible says that basically faith without action is the basic thing that demons do. Then the Bible says in verse 20, but are you willing to recognize, oh foolish fellow, what fellow? What did he begin with in verse 14, my dear? Brethren. So who is this foolish fellow? Where are the brethren? Pastor calls you, you foolish fellow, you'll get upset. Bible bonified verse. <laughs> Amen. Bible bonified verse is like, you foolish fellow. What is the foolishness? The foolishness to think that I can believe and I can live how I want. That's foolish. That I can make choices where to live, how to live, what to do. No, my life is not my own. I'm bought with a price. I belong to Jesus. Where he wants me to live, I live. What he wants me to do, I do. You know why? Because unless he helps you and me breathe his neck, our next breath. Yesterday I was at my father's sister's funeral. And standing there at the funeral, I just looked at all the people. And I saw so many people back in my village. Just people that are old and people that are aging. And I, and I knew, I looked at them and I said, she's not there, she's gone. There's just a body. I said, but you guys are still here. What I really want you to know is that the Bible says it is appointed for man to die once and then judgment. Are you ready to meet this king? And if we are not ready to meet this king, we need to turn around. The Bible says, we in verse 24, look at verse 24. Remember, we, we, we established before that we are justified by faith. Now read verse 24, read it loud. You see that a man is justified. Oh, come on now. How are we justified? But I thought we, Romans 3 said we're justified by faith and nothing else. This is why we cannot read Romans without reading Galatians. You can't read Galatians without reading James. Why? Scripture interprets Scripture. Amen. You can't pull one portion of Scripture out and make your own theology out of it. You have to. So, what, so actually now, having heard so much, are we justified by faith or by grace? Come on. We are justified by the faith, by grace, through faith. But the Bible says that if we are justified by grace through faith, it is the beginning of our salvation. And then the Bible says that if we are justified by grace through faith, there will naturally be works of faith. It's not talking about works to be saved, it's talking about works because you are saved. Amen. Because I married my wife, from that day onwards, there were works of being a husband, taking care of the family, responsibility. I stopped looking out because this was my family from this point onwards. What is that? Works of my covenant. In the same way, if you have a covenant with God, you can look nowhere else. You can live in no other way. You can have no other spouse other than the bridegroom that the Lord has kept himself as. So what are the difference between these different kinds of works? Let me introduce three words to you so you understand that quickly. In the Bible, the three words that are there, the first one is called the works of faith. The, wor the works of the law, I'm sorry. The, fir the first word that is, is called the works of the law. What is this works of the law? This is the works that had to be done by the Jews, by whom? By the Jews to become righteous by obeying the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law. By obeying the Ten Commandments, the Mosaic Law, the Jews became righteous. Then we see a second kind of work is called the works of the flesh. This is what Galatians chapter 5 verse 19 onwards, 19 to 21 says, the works of the flesh are obvious. Immorality and licentiousness, all kinds of wickedness, all that's the works of the flesh. Thirdly, the third kind of works is called the works of 
The problem is that people mix it all up. They mix up the works of the law and they mix it with works of faith. Every child of God, the Bible says, once you're in Christ, there has to come a works of faith. It's not because of I'm in Christ, not, not that I have to do this so somehow to get saved. It's because I'm saved, now I have no other option because I'm a slave of Christ. Amen. Does a slave have an option? Do you own a car? Some of you own a car? Yeah? The, the, the tissue paper box in your car, is that yours or is it mine? Whose is it? It's yours, right? How about the ignition key or the radio fit in the car? Is that yours or is it mine? Which means everything in that car, that, that's part of that car belongs to you, right? The carburetor, the engine, is, it's yours or it's, it's yours, right? So in the same way, once you, you are in Christ, you belong to Christ, your choices in life, are they yours or are they Christ's? They're Christ's. So therefore, once anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation, he belongs wholly to Christ. Which means the choices we make, they belong to Christ. So there are works of faith. Once I belong to Christ, I believe in him, then those works begin to come out. What are those works? Galatians 2, 5, verse 22 to 25. It goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit, that there are works of the law, we see that. There are works of the flesh, and, uh, which is all kinds of wickedness. And that's what the Bible says, works of the flesh. Ephesians 5, 11 says, the last part, do not participate in the unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even what? Expose them. If there is wickedness that is happening in people's life, the Bible says we're supposed to expose them. No, brother, don't talk about it. He's our brother. We don't talk about anything like that. No, the Bible says if there's sin, we have to expose those deeds happening in the house of God. It has to be spoken about. Then there's the works of faith. According to grace, we do the works of faith. Now that we're saved, what are the works of faith? Come on, read this with me. But the fruit of the Spirit is what? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against this there is no, no law. Now, which law is this talking about? Is this talking about the law? Which law is it talking about? It's talking about righteousness coming from the, the Mosaic law. But there is a law. What is the law? The law is the law of the Spirit. Romans 8 says we are away from the law of sin and death. Now we are under the law of the Spirit. So there's nothing against it. There is a law that is for it. What is that law? The law of the Spirit. Now some people say, so by faith, the Holy Spirit is given. So the law of the Spirit has freed us from having to live a, a life in obedience to God. It's by faith. No, read on. Now those who belong to Christ, come on. Those who but belong to Christ have what? Which means those who have not crucified their flesh. Come on. Any English teachers here? I need some English teacher. Help me with the grammar. Somebody. Now, those who belong to Christ Jesus. You know what that means? Those who are sold out to Christ Jesus. Have crucified the flesh. I'm not saying it's sinless. I'm saying that we begin, begin to sin less and less and less and less. Because we... If we sin, we have an advocate with the Father. But we do not give ourselves permission to sin. Amen. So if you belong to Christ, we have crucified the flesh. Which means when the flesh tells you to do something against the word, the Bible says you remember you are crucified. With its what? Passions and its. Which means if by, guys, guys, if by faith I'm born again, then that faith tells me that I must crucify my passion and desire. But, but some people say, no, it is God who crucifies it. God doesn't crucify it. How do I know that? Because my Bible tells me, put off the old man with his desires. And what? Put on the new man. Who's going to put it off and who's going to put it on? We put it off. Who's going to put it on? The new man. We're going to put it on. Which means it's we who are doing it. Then it says in verse 25, if we live by the Spirit... Which means if we live by the Spirit. Now some people say, no, it is by faith. All right, okay. If by faith, by the finished work of the cross, you are living in the Spirit. The Bible says, let's also walk in it. Let's keep walking in it. 
So this is why Colossians 1.10 says, so that you can walk in a manner, walk in a manner, which means he got you in me saved. Now it's time for us to walk in a manner worthy of what God has done for us. What is that worthy manner? To please him in Oh, but I thought we already pleased him by faith. Hebrews 11, 6. Help me, guys. Have we pleased him by faith already? Yes. But then why does Paul write this to Colossians? Is he having forgetfulness? Why, why does he say we have to what? Please him in? But the preachers won't tell you that. They will say you are pleasing to God already. Now, yes, you are pleasing to God. That's by the finished work across. I don't minimize that. But God is saying, if you know what it means for to be forgiven, if you know what, you see, you re- remove repentance from it, you remove gratitude. You remove gratitude, the Bible says, to whom much is forgiven, loveth much. You remove love out of that relationship and only salvation, you have no, no desire to obey God. Do you understand that? The moment you take love out of the equation, there is no desire to obey God. Why? I want to follow my lust. But the moment you put love in, you no longer want to break God's heart. So you have pleased Him by faith. What is that faith? But you pleased Him by, what is that faith? Not just believing in Jesus. By repenting from the life you had. By acknowledging you need a Savior. And by saying, God, I have sinned and I want you to come into my life. That pleased Him. The desire to come back to him pleased him. And it says, therefore, when we please him in all respects, what are we doing? Bearing fruit in, which means when we please him, we're bearing fruit. Which means if I have pleased God, Hebrews eleven six, 6, by faith, I will bear fruit of my faith. My faith becomes real, not that demonic faith. What is that demonic faith? Faith without action. Which means if I really please God, I will begin to bear fruit in every good work, which means I will begin to serve God with all my heart, all my soul, all my mind. There are many people professing to know God. In fact, Titus chapter 1, uh, Titus chapter 1, verse 5 to 16. In Titus 1, 1, he, he writes, he's writing to the elect in the church. Elect is what? Born again or not born again? Born again, right? Now look at verse 5. Titus 1, 5. In verse 5, he says like this, For this reason I left you in Crete, that you would set in order what remains and appoint elders in every city as I directed you. He's talking about appointing pastors, okay? He's saying, I'm appointing pastors in every city. And then he says, the pastor must have some qualifications. You just can't become a pastor. Listen, grace calls you to be a pastor. Obedience qualifies you to be a pastor. Hello? Amen. Grace calls you to be a pastor because it's by grace, but obedience qualifies you. What's a pastor's job? To model. What's a father's job? To model. What's a mother's job? To model. So if we are modeling bad, we are not being a good father or mother. So what do we do? We've got to fix that model. So if a, as a pastor, we're not modeling. Someone, someone, I think years ago, someone in this church came and asked me, Pastor, where in the Bible does it say that we should have only one wife? I forgot who it was, but somebody asked me. Only in our church they'll ask these questions. The person meant scripturally. Where in the Bible does it say? Because we read the Bible. So I was wondering, one wife itself is a lifetime to figure out that equation. Why does he want more than one wife? This, is, this was beyond me. So maybe, he, you know, he has a Solomon anointing or something. I don't know. But, but, but I, I, so I asked him why. He said, Bible says only, only about the pastors, it says pastors must be husband or one wife. <laughs> so I was thinking in my heart, fellow, why God doesn't love us pastors? He wants only the others to have more wives. Why he doesn't want pastors to have? So <laughs> I looked at him for a while. He says, pastor, where does it say that a Christian must have only one wife? I looked at him and said, the problem is you're reading only the Bible from here and there. You know, some people, they read the Bible two verses. It's like eating chore rice. Two grains of rice, then digest it nicely for two months. Get revelation from that two verse. After that, you'll read two more verses like that. You read the Bible like that, you'll understand the Bible only like that. I looked at him and said, I said, you know why the Bible says that the pastor should be the husband of one wife? He said, why? I said, so that he can model it to the church how they can live. You look sad this day. (laughs) What's the problem here? 
you upset with me for having one wife only? What's your problem? <laughs> you know why a pastor should have one wife? God says, I want you to model it. Why does the pastor should not be a lover of money? He wants you to model it. Why should the pastor not be uh, someone who's fighting with everybody, causing divisions in the church? He wants you to model how to be peacemakers. Come on now. Why should the pastor, the Bible says, he must not be fond of sordid gain, must not be a lover of money. Otherwise, how can he confidently stand up and tell you not to fall in love with money? Why should the pastor be a lover of good, sensible? He must be sensible so that his church will be sensible. Just, and he says all these things. Then it says in verse 10, he says, for there are many rebellious men. What kind of men? Who are these rebellious men Paul is talking about? Pastors, hello. He's saying there are many rebellious men, empty talkers and deceivers. Pastors, leaders, full-time ministers, preachers, teachers. Popular, some very popular on TV. He says, especially those of the circumcision, especially those who believe their lineage has been around for a long while now. Traditional Christian leaders. Those of the circumcision, go on next verse. It says, rebellious people, empty talkers, deceivers, they must be silenced because they are upsetting whole families, teaching things that should not be taught for, for sordid gain, which means they teach you something that will keep you happy as long as you'll give them offering. That's what this Bible says. It says there are people in the church who will teach you what you want to hear because as long as you're happy to hear what they're saying, you will bless them. And they need this to continue. The Bible says to reprove them severely. We have to speak up. Look at verse 16. What does it say? Read it. Help me. They profess to know God, but their deeds deny them. Who professes to know God? The church pastors, teachers who claim to know God, but their life doesn't back it up. And it says, they deny him being what? He's calling the ungodly Christian leaders who refuse to speak the truth. Bible calls them detestable. Detestable and disobedient and what? Worthless. You know that salt that has lost its saltiness cannot influence other than keeping the people happy. Oh, just be happy. God loves you. Just be happy. No, no, no. God just, God's, God just doesn't want you to be only happy. He wants you to be like Jesus. He wants you and me to be transformed. Some people say, well, it's only the works. The only works that God wants is that we must believe. John's Gospel 6, 28, 29. Come back to the slide. Uh, John 6, 28, 29. So the Bible says here, therefore he said to them, what shall we do? Now, this is a popular verse taken by people. The works in the New Testament is the works of faith, they say. Therefore, they said to them, what shall we do so that we may work the works of God? And Jesus said, this is the work of God that you believe. So they say, see, the New Testament doesn't have works. It is the work of God that you believe in Jesus. Now, the problem with this scripture is, they forget that scripture interprets scripture. Amen? Remember, I talked to you about eternal life. Those who are going to damnation also have. Life eternal, but they don't have eternal life. Amen. Knowing Jesus is eternal life. Now, if works of God is believing Jesus, then I want you to read John 14, 12. Look what, this is, what it says in John's Gospel 14, 12. If believing Jesus alone is the works of God, can you throw that up for me, please? It says in John 14, yeah, John 14, 12, right? Look at this. Truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, now hold it, what will a true believer do? Come on. You know what he's saying? The sign of a true believer is the works. So if John 6 said, the works of God is to believe, it means if the works of God is to be a solid believer, Jesus says in John 14, a solid believer will do the works of God. You know what that means? The works of God 
should be manifested as the works of God in the world only if the conductor is a true believer. Come on now. Amen. He said, he who believes in me, that is the will of God, John 6. He who believes in me will do the works of God. He who believes in me, the works I do, he will also do. Which means when they tell you the will of God is to be someone who believes in Jesus, it means the will of God is to do the works that Jesus does. Hallelujah. Today is not a happy day for you guys. You guys are going really quiet on me. Do I have some believers in the house today? Come on. Yeah, okay. So true believers will do the works of God. Believing is to know God. Matthew 7, you remember that scripture? Matthew 7, 22, 23. Many will be, say to me on that day. Which day? Judgment day. So this is not talking about the past. It's talking about on that day. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? Prophecy is Old Testament or New Testament? That gift. Both. First Corinthians 12, prophecy, New Testament. Elijah, Elisha, Moses, all Old Testament. So prophecy is both, okay? Then it says, in your name will we not, will not cast out demons. Old Testament or New Testament? New Testament. Why? Old Testament, Jesus had not died on the cross. They didn't have authority over demons. So this is talking to Old Testament saints or New Testament saints? New Testament saints. So he says, in that day, which day? Judgment day. Many will come and say, did we not prophesy in your name? So this context is now New Testament. Did we not cast out demons in your name? Which means believer's authority. Did we not perform miracles in your name? That's old and new. But we saw from demons that this is New Testament. And I will declare to them, I never knew you. I never knew you. Depart from me, you workers of iniquity. Which means he's saying, I didn't know you because from the works that you did, the life you lived, you are not the children of God. You're not living for the Lord. True grace makes you work for Him. He says, I, the grace of God, Paul writes like this. He says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. But His grace to me did not prove in vain. I labored so much more. So if this is truly the works of faith, if it's truly, Jesus said, my will is to do the, the work of God. So what, are, what is truly the work of faith? It talks about two things. How do I know what is the work of faith? Two things happen. The work of faith is that my life begins to change. That my life begins to be transformed. That I used to, to lie before. Now I'm saying, no, I, I shouldn't lie. I want to lie, but I say, no, no, don't lie. Why? Because the Bible says, liars will not go to heaven. Why? Because that's a sign of following the devils. God does not want us to lie. He wants us to be honest. So, Transform living. What about immorality? You may have lived in sin. God is saying, don't live in that anymore. You may have cheated. Now, God is saying, don't cheat anymore. Whatever. He, he looked at that lady. said, has nobody condemned you? She said, no. He said, now go and sin no more. That is a transformed life. Everyone say transformed life. So what is the first work of faith? A changed life. The second work of faith is a completed assignment. Not only does God want your nature to change, He has an assignment for you. And every child of God, every day of His life, is focused on an inside transformation and an outside assignment to finish. That is the work of God. That every day we begin to think about this transformation and this assignment. This is why the Bible says, on that day, the Bible says, the night is almost gone. The day is near. Let us lay aside all these different things that have been causing sin. A completed work, Mark 13, 32 onwards, it says like this, of that day or hour no one knows, not even the angels, nor the son, the father alone, take heed. Be on the alert for you don't know what the appointed time is. A man, he's gone on a journey, but he's coming back. And if he's coming back, he's going to ask each one. Each servant was given an assignment. Some servants slept. Are we sleeping on the assignment? Do we know what the will of God is? And he's saying, don't sleep on the assignment. Paul writes in Romans 15, when we are transformed in such a powerful way, look what Paul writes, Romans 15, 23. But now, with no further place for me in these regions, 
And since I have had for many years a longing to come to you. He's saying there's, there's no place left in this region to preach. Paul was saying, I'm on my assignment so much. Every day, I'm proclaiming Jesus. What's your assignment? Transform life. Proclaim Christ. Tell others about Jesus that, that they don't have to go to hell. Tell others about Jesus, the proclaiming about Jesus. That's your assignment. Our assignment is not just doing a little here and there. No more room left anywhere to preach. And he goes on to say, he, he, he talks, tells the church also, you must do that. And that we can be an approved worker of God. That we will not be people that have confession. You know, remember the two sons? One son said, father said, go to the vineyard. One son said, I will go. And he didn't. And the other one said, I won't go. But he, the Bible says, who pleased the father? The one who went. Many of us in the churches are spending Sunday after Sunday saying, here I am, send me Lord. Here I am, send me Lord. Monday morning, Lord, I'm so sorry, I'd love to go, but I'm, I'm too busy, Lord. Lord, I really want to go, you know my heart, but I can't, Lord. Lord, my father and mother, they won't let me go. They are the problem. And the Bible says there are some other sons, the prostitutes, the sinners, the tax collectors, the wicked, the ungodly, all kinds. They looked at God and said, we won't go. And then one day, their heart was turned and they said, Lord, we will go. And Jesus looked at them and said, to whom much is forgiven, much they will do for God. You know why we don't do for God? We don't know what it means to be forgiven. If we knew what we are forgiven from, we would go out and proclaim. We would go in the highways, the Bibles, we'd go to the workspace, we'd go to our churches, we'd go to our places, we'd go to the city, we'd go to our neighborhood, we'd go, we'd tell, our, tell them about the wonderful things that God has done, the good news of the gospel. The Bible says in Philippians 2, the Bible talks about a man called Epaphroditus. This is so powerful, I just sat there reading this for a moment, I got stuck, a man called Epaphroditus. He says, my fellow brother, fellow soldier, who is your messenger also. He's writing to the Philippians. He says, because he's longing for you all the time, distressed and he's praying. You heard that he was sick. You were all upset. Indeed, he was sick till the point of death. But God had mercy on him and also on me so that I wouldn't have to sorrow. Therefore, I sent him all the more eagerly to you. And when you see him, you might rejoice. Now, this is what touched me. Receive him in the Lord with all joy. He's writing to the whole Philippian church. Receive this man that is proclaiming the gospel with all joy. Why? Hold men like him in high regard. How do you hold them? High regard. Why? Because he came close to death for the work of Christ, risking his life. Now look at that. Risking his life, what? To complete that which is deficient. In your service to me. Look, look at me. It's not there on the scripture. To complete what is deficient in your service to me. You know what he's saying? He's saying Epaphroditus almost lost his life doing the work that you guys were supposed to do. He's telling the Philippian church he almost lost his life because he was doing what you all were supposed to do for me. That's what Paul says. Because he, you guys didn't do it, Philippian church. Epaphroditus stepped in. And I want you to know so many great saints of God are almost losing their life because the church has faith with no works. They don't have the faith of God. Be zealous and do the works of God. Stir up one another, the Bible says. Shake somebody's hand. Just shake, shake them and say, do the works of God. This is what Paul is saying. Stir people to do the works of God. Say, we must live to do the works of God. Support these workers. Stand with them. And you yourself must do the works of God. And the Bible says, when we get to heaven, Romans 2, 6 says, God will give each one according to his works. When we get to heaven. God is going to reward us. For God is not unjust to forget your labor. God will not forget. That's why 2 John 2.8 says, watch yourself. Watch yourself. Watch yourself that you will not lose what you have accomplished till now. 
but you will receive a full reward. Which means it's possible to not receive a full reward. It's possible to get a, a small reward, a tiny reward, a minor reward, a little part of the reward, a short part of it, rather than getting a full reward of God. God is calling us back to a life of the works of faith. God's not calling us back to just an agreement to your faith. He's saying if you have faith, let your works accompany your faith. Put your action where your confession is. And then God will begin to transform your life and family in such a way. And every one of you, as your eye closed, let's pray together. The Bible says, every one of us, we are bought with a price. We are not our own. We are slaves of Christ. For we are crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live now, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. God is calling us back to the works of faith. What are the works? He's calling you to a changed nature, a life, and to an intense mission that you will do what God has given you grace for, that you would serve him with all your heart. And if any of you know that you've been living a life in a careless way, God is saying, come back, come to the family come back home that you not only would have begun your salvation but that you would finish your salvation with fear and trembling and when he calls us by name we will go home and we will hear well done my good and faithful servant which means someone who works for me not well done my good faithful believer so good and faithful servant father we commit our lives we commit our future we commit our obedience into your hands you have begun something good. You are faithful to bring it to completion. And we submit our lives to you. We belong to you in Jesus' mighty name. And those of you that are agreeing with me, say amen. 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 God bless you.